Hello everybody, welcome to another Yellow Chair Devotional. Are you ready to explore another book of the Bible? We are looking at one book every single day, seeing what theme, how a story or a verse from each book contributes to the big story of the Bible. Because ultimately, all of the Bible is God's story of his amazing love for you and me. How he seeks us out, how he wants to redeem and save us. Okay, so we have been putting the books of the Bible into categories. We looked at the first five books of the Bible, which we would said were the Pentateuch. And now we've been journeying through the historical books, all right? There's been quite a few historical books. Look at all my cards here. And the historical books are tracing the history of the nation of Israel. So while the Pentateuch gives us the beginning, the creation, and then the introduction to a family that becomes the Israelites, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so on and so forth, now we have the nation of Israel and they are figuring out what it is to follow God. And sometimes they're right on, but oftentimes they waver depending on who their leader is. And so we saw how David was an amazing king for them. And he was an amazing king because he remembered who the true king was. But other kings, oh, they started falling away. And even though Solomon built that amazing temple in Jerusalem to worship God and he dedicates it, it doesn't take long before Israel has broken in two into Israel and Judah. And each of the kings here, right, we just said it got so messy, so messy to the point where about 400 plus years go by and the nations get captured. Assyria, Babylon invades, and Jerusalem is destroyed. Jerusalem, where the, um, the temple is that Solomon built, the palace that David built, the whole city is destroyed. And oh, how that would feel, because it's, it's different than, let's pretend that a flood came, or a fire, or an earthquake. Think of all the natural disasters that you see sometimes, where you see where they like decimate, a tornado wipes out a town. That's really hard, isn't it? Oh, it's so sad. I can't imagine having my home destroyed or a whole town destroyed. But this was next level for Jerusalem to be destroyed. That was where God's presence lived. That was the high place. That's where the king lived. That's where the temple of God was. Right? So it's, it's almost... To compare it to the United States, right? If all of a sudden Washington, D.C., if, if the White House, the Lincoln Memorial, the Capitol building, all of that was destroyed. All right? Those are just buildings, but they kind of represent the United States, right? That's where our leader resides, our president resides. So the king, he lived in the palace, but even so much more was the temple where God dwelled. All right. And so we saw yesterday that Ezra, time has passed, 70-ish years has passed. Their time of being in Babylon has come to an end and King Cyrus releases Ezra and a group and they return and they're going to rebuild the temple. Oh, and they are, they are ready to start rebuilding a place of worship to God. And I'm so glad that God can be worshipped by us anywhere, even here sitting in my yellow chair, right? God is with us everywhere, but it is so nice to have a special place to go to worship God. And so they're rebuilding this temple. Well, let's look at the next layer of this building project. That's the book of Nehemiah, all right? So Nehemiah. So we want to find the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 2. All right, so Nehemiah, he actually worked for the king, the king in Babylon. His name was Artaxerxes, and Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. All right, so like he would drink out of the, the king's cup or taste the king's food to make sure no one had poisoned, right? Like he was very trusted and close to the king. 
And so he works for this king in Babylon because that's where Israel has been living. That's where the, the nation of like the kingdom of Judah had been. But people are starting to return to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah has heard that Ezra and this group have gone and they're starting to rebuild the temple. And then in, ver in chapter 1, Nehemiah finds out that the walls around Jerusalem are destroyed. And it says that it makes him just so sad that he cries. He hears that the walls of the city of Jerusalem were destroyed and he sat down and cried. What's the significance there? Like it's one thing to think about God's temple being destroyed and that making me sad and crying. Why? is Nehemiah crying about the walls, the walls around a city? Well, I think about how the walls, they were the protection. They were the protection for everything, but especially they were the fortress, the protection for God's temple. And so Nehemiah goes, we need to rebuild those walls. Ezra and his crew, they're rebuilding the temple, the temple for God so that we can all gather and worship together. We need to protect it. We need to rebuild the walls. And so in chapter two, he's going to talk to the king about it. Let's read. So pause if you need a little bit more time to find it. Nehemiah chapter two, right at the beginning in verse one. It was the month of Nisan. It was in the 20th year, King Artaxerxes was king and he wanted some wine. So I took some and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king says, why does your face look sad? You're not sick. Your heart must be sad. Wow, imagine how Nehemiah must have looked for the king to notice that he's so sad. Then I was very afraid. I said to the king, may the king live forever. My face is sad because the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Then the king said to me, what do you want? First, I prayed to the God of heaven. Then I answered the king. Oh, we got to pause and look at that, right? The king asked Nehemiah, what do you want? And what does Nehemiah do? He prays. Then he answers the king. Oftentimes, I don't know about you, but I just answer people, oh, what do you want? And I just tell them, I don't first pray about it. Sometimes I just go off of what I'm feeling, right? Nehemiah is feeling sad. And the king notices it, but Nehemiah wants to make sure, do I talk to the king about this? Do I, do I tell him what I really want or do I not? God, is this what you want from me? Because the enemy can use our feelings sometimes. Our enemy can use those feelings and, the, and Satan will make us feel all sorts of things. He'll make us feel sad. He'll make us feel angry. He'll make us feel lonely. He'll make us feel all these things in hopes that we won't pray to God. We'll act on how we're feeling, right? If I'm frustrated about something, if someone is annoying me and I'm losing my patience, oh, the enemy wants me to say something that I'll regret or to lash out physically or with my words that hurt instead of first praying and going, God, will, will you help me with this? I don't want to lose my temper. I don't want to say something I'll regret. It's so good when we can remember to check in with God about our feelings because feelings can be a tug of war. All right. And so we want to, ch I love that Nehemiah checks in with God about his feelings. So the, he's feeling so sad that it's noticeable on his face. The king goes, what do you want? And first Nehemiah prays to God. Then verse five, then I answered the king, send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried. I will rebuild it. Do this if you are willing and if I have pleased you. And so from there, 
the king and the queen, they go, all right, how long of a trip? And he tells them and they say, go. Then Nehemiah goes one step further. He goes, will you give me a letter giving me permission, making sure I have safe passage? Will you give me some of the army? Hey, how about some supplies? Nehemiah knows because he prayed to God first. He knows that God is, is leading and guiding him. And so he's asking the king, can I go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem? Will you send me help? Will you support me on this? Will you protect me? When we check in with God on things, all oh, the doors start opening for us to lead out in God's plans. Because God wants Nehemiah to rebuild the walls. So now we're going to skip down to verse 11. Because now Nehemiah has arrived. All right, so verse 11. I went to Jerusalem and stayed there three days. Then at night I started out with a few men. I had not told anyone what God had caused me to do for Jerusalem. There were no animals with me except the one I was riding. It was night. I went out through the valley gate. I rode toward the dragon well and the trash gate. I was inspecting the walls of Jerusalem. They had been broken down and the gates had been destroyed by fire. Then I rode on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for the animal I was riding to get through. So I went up the valley at night. I was inspecting the wall. Finally, I turned and went back in through the valley gate. The officers did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. I had not yet said anything to the Jews, the priests, the important men, or the officers. I had not said anything to any of the others who would do the work. So he goes and he inspects the wall first. He goes around it and he sees that it's broken and destroyed by fire. And there's parts where it's so busted up that he can't even get through with an animal, right? Not if he's on a horse or a mule. But he didn't tell anyone what he was doing there. He didn't say to anybody, we're going to rebuild these walls until he went and looked at it first. He wanted to look at it and get an idea. And then in verse 17, the people are gathered. Then, then I said to them, you can see the trouble we have here. Jerusalem is a pile of ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Then we won't be full of shame any longer. I also told them how God had been kind to me. And I told them what the king had said to me. Then they answered, let's start rebuilding. So they began to work hard. And uh, Nehemiah and his crew get to work rebuilding the walls because they want to restore Jerusalem. They want the walls to be up to protect the temple, to protect the place of worship. And they know that God is with them. Nehemiah and his crew aren't going to have an easy time, but they do rebuild it. And the book concludes with Ezra and all of the people gathered together, rededicating the nation of Israel to God, saying, we are home in Jerusalem. We are your people, God. We want to stay true to you. And it's all because of people like Ezra and Nehemiah who listen to the promptings of God and they said, let's rebuild, let's rededicate, let's do this. They had a vision to do something for God, right? And what I think is so cool is if we were to fast forward to the New Testament and we were to fast forward to the time of Jesus, the walls around Jerusalem that Jesus is passing through, the temple in Jerusalem that everyone is visiting, it's the ones that are getting built right here. They are building something that's going to stand there and be there all the way forward to when the true King Jesus comes. Think about Jesus on the donkey entering the city and everyone saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Sometimes we don't see the big picture. We don't know what part we play. We might just have a burden on our heart from God to build something for him. And those seeds get planted. We do the work with, with God's inspiration and power. And we don't know what difference it might make. 
years and years and years and years from now. But that's how God works. God is a God of the long game right? He's always seeking us, always pursuing us. He doesn't move like a microwave in like 30 seconds and we're done. Now God is in it for the long haul and he is using the things that we do now to make a difference years from now. And someday when we're all in heaven in the new Jerusalem, we're going to get to see the difference that we made and maybe we didn't even realize it or maybe other times like Nehemiah or like Ezra God places that burden on our heart and we answer that call and we check in with him about what we're feeling and we say yeah we're we're doing this this is what God wants us to do and we know that God's going to do something amazing with it in the future all right let's say a prayer together and we'll close our time Dear God, we're so thankful that you use us in your building process. You use the small pieces that we contribute, our ideas, our visions, our passions, and you use them to make a difference in the lives of others. And so may we be listening to what you want us to do for you. And may we also check in with you about those feelings that we feel at times. And may we remember that you want to be close to us and tabernacle in our hearts. We thank you so much for your love in your name. Amen. All right. There are some discussion questions in the video description below. If you want to ponder Nehemiah a little bit more, you can explore more of his story. But our verse for Nehemiah is Nehemiah 2, 17, where Nehemiah says, So I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's walls so that we will no longer be a disgrace. It's time to rebuild, Nehemiah says. Let's do this for God. What do you want to do for God today? Think about that and I'll see you tomorrow.